With us now is Jacob Cooper. Welcome to the show, Jacob. Thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's a true honor. Thank it was you. very exciting because so many people told me about your story, but we hadn't met in person. So this is life after breath. Yes, yes. Wow, so you had a near-death experience. So can you talk to me about it so that our audience can learn a little bit more about what happened to you? Absolutely. In September of 1993, at the age of three years old, I had what's called whooping cough, or otherwise known, generically known as pertussis, which for infants or children could be fatal if left untreated. And I went to a playground with family friends, and going up onto a ladder, onto a slide, I began to suffocate. And once I lost my breath, I found a new breath within that could never be taken from me. And uh, I literally felt my body shutting down and literally my brain was deprived of oxygen and I heard a large snap. And once okay. my brain snapped in half, that's when, as the saying goes, God came in, so to speak. And I had a lot of mystical encounters from awareness of spiritual guides, soul family members, mm -hmm. awareness of previous carnations, angels, uh, you know, and much more that's really chronicled in Life After Breath. Now, growing up Jewish, right, and then uh, what was your family's reaction to this? The fact that you that this happened to you? How did that change the dynamics of your family? Yeah, you no, know, I grew up in a very much a traditional Jewish family. Went to private school and you know, yeshiva and everything like that. But you know, near death. It's inter it's interesting. Near death experiencers, researchers will tell you that it takes a child, or in my case, an infant, around 20 to 30 years to process, make sense, and integrate it. And as we know, words are healing for other people, but when you're having these experiences and you're crossing over to the other side, words are quite limiting and don't do justice. And so for me, the degree of emotional vocabulary, lexicon for the experience, I was not able to do up until probably my early 20s, until I read a book by a best-selling author by the name of Betty Eady called Embrace by the Light. It was there that I had a formal, formal diagnosis of the near-death experience, but Otherwise, I really kept this very much close to my heart um, for, for years. And I would think, because it happened to you when you were so young, that you didn't realize that you were unique, somewhat unique, right? Like, because this was just your normal life. You're three, and you go on about your business, and then all of a sudden you get to the point of epiphany. So when was a pivotal moment for you? When did you, like, see a different light? And you yeah. wake up and say, oh, my gosh, this, is, this has happened to me. When you have a near-death experience, there's a trauma, which I do believe allowed me to recall the experience, retain it from intensified trauma. Combine that, that this was an experience that wasn't produced by my, my own brain, but rather went through myself and my own brain. It was beyond the body, and so that's why I do believe I was able to retain it. But it was one day when I was younger, and from having this experience and having my brain affected by it, I was able to have a pillar of light going through my brain as a younger kid, and I would be able to connect to that, and that would open up doors interdimensionally. And it was one day, and I chronicle this in Life yes. After Breath, where I turned out a classmate and I was having conversations with others from the other side, interdimensional communication. And the classmate, you know, almost, almost gave me the Dwayne Johnson, the people's eyebrow look like I was from <laughs> some different planet. And uh, that to me, you know, the suffocating was very difficult, but to have this experience and feeling very isolating Isolating was was a deprivation of oxygen that I had that was even stronger than my near-death experience. So that degree of loneliness that I had and feeling alone with it was was challenging. Now you took those challenges though and now you're in a position to help others, right? You're a clinical social worker, you're a Reiki master, um, or just a practitioner. Mm -hmm. how, how, how well, how, how much Reiki do you know, Jacob? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a Reiki practitioner and okay. a certified hypnotherapist too. Okay. Um, so much of my goal and impetus behind writing Life After Breath and within my own work is to give back what I was given. When my body was lifeless and it was irresponsive, I was given an awareness of an eternal breath. And I know within the Jewish faith, spirit is known as ruach, which literally means the wind of God or the spirit of God. And I remembered that when we lose our breath, there's an eternal breath that can never be taken from us. And so much of what's happening today is on a literal or metaphorical basis. People are losing their breath of some sorts. And it's my hope that through my work, directly or indirectly, 
that people could have the breath of inspiration, which I do believe is the oxygen of the soul. I, I believe that as well. I think that that's universal. Doesn't matter where you come from, what religion you believe in, or anything like that. There is one common denominator in a lot of humans, and that is that sense of soul, that, that spiritualness that's inside of all human beings, which uh, unites us. So congratulations. I also know that on the front of your cover of your book, as we're wrapping up, tell us who endorsed your book. Yes, it's funny. Um, when I first heard about you, you had another guest. Um, I don't know if I could say his name. Of course you can. His, his name is Jeffrey Wands. Okay. Right? And I was reading his book, and I saw that he had all these experiments with Dr. Raymond Moody. And after seeing that, there was a voice that told me that you're going to connect with this man one day. At the time, I thought it was crazy, because I know Oprah mentioned him. He's, he's world-renowned, one of the most brilliant men I've ever encountered. Um, he's got a PhD in philosophy and a psychiatry degree, all before like the age of like 30 or 30. This man is brilliant. Uh, but, but in 1975, in his book, Life After Life, through his own research, he coined the term near-death experience, which wasn't his first go-to. He wanted more of an academic kind of term, but they, <laughs> that was more of a household name that people would understand. But what's interesting about the term near-death experience is the fact that it has the word death in it is the furthest thing from an NDE. It is diametrically opposite from death. And that's why he wrote the book Life After Life, to really understand that there's just eternal life. You know, death is an illusion. And his, uh, uh, Dr. Raymond Moody, is, is right here. So he's right, he's right on my cover. And so to get Raymond, Dr. Raymond Moody to endorse my book, uh, I was speechless. That was a greatest honor of my lifetime uh, to get him to endorse it. And also Anita Morjani, who had you know, cancer, and she had a, a profound near-death experience. And she wrote you know, two, ne two New York Times bestselling books. And so to get her on the list, along with many others, uh, it was quite humbling, to say the least. Well, congratulations on their affirmations Thank of you. your journey. Um, wishing you continued success in all you do, and especially to all those that you are in service to. So congratulations, and thank you very, very much for joining us today. Um, and if you would like to know more about Life After Breath, it's all here in this book. Stay tuned for more. We've been living it up right here with Jacob.